really good at putting up walls. Not in a carpentry sense, but in a compartmentalization sense. Are you skilled? Do you have a graduate degree in putting up walls? I was witnessing a form of uh, prayer and counseling. I had not seen this practice before, and, and someone wanted to show me kind of how the process worked, and so I agreed to go and sit in a, as an observer. And basically, it was, it was a form of counseling that was using prayer as a guide. And, and so I, I watched this individual just set, this, set the stage for prayer, and another person began to pray. And at a certain point in the prayer, the, the person kind of prompting asked if there was any, anything that the person who was praying was not letting Christ enter. Was there a space that Christ was being resisted? I thought this is quite interesting. Just just observing. And what happened is something I didn't expect. The individual just started to um, get teary and a little trembly. And for the first time in this adult woman's life, she revealed some things that had happened to her that were not her fault when she was a minor. And it was the first time that she had ever brought it into the light. And and in that moment, there was a a, a welcoming of Christ to come into that space with her. And and as a result, she felt a sense of, of peace and release. having let that guard down. Have you ever experienced anything like that? Where you, or for a long time, you may have held up a a wall of resistance to something. And then either either by sheer exhaustion (laughs) or by the mercy and the grace of God, the wall came down and he drew near. Have you experienced that? Have you experienced the drawing near presence of God in your life before? I think it's one of the greatest privileges we have as the children of God, as the people of God, that we have a loving and living God who that is His desire. His desire is to come near and to draw near. And yet, what is it about us that can easily resist or can cordon off parts of ourselves that we say, you can have access to this and to this, but not behind this door, not into this space. And I believe we do have a common problem, and that is we believe a compartmentalized life is just life. I mean, I'm able to stand up here and not completely fall apart uh, because K-State destroyed the Oklahoma Sooners yesterday. And that is safely compartmentalized in a little box. That's my football pain. We believe a compartmentalized life is just life. And I, and I think that we, when it comes to this idea of building walls or compartmentalization, uh, this has been kind of woven into our fabric because, first of all, it's coached. It's just life. Just pull it together. Now, there was a moment early in my ministry where there were a very difficult task was, was in front of myself and in front of our lead pastor. We were going to have to go and confront a dearly loved brother, and, um, and the circumstances were not anything that any one of us would want, and I began to break down. 
And I can remember to this day, uh, it'll be, it'll be a phrase in ministry that, that I won't ever forget. And he just said, there will be a time to cry, but now is a time to lead. And what was he saying? He was saying that for the time being, we're going to pull it together. We're going to put it in a, in a compartment. And then we're going to have to go and deal with reality. Now, what he didn't say was to take what was put in that compartment, put it in a vault and lock it and throw away the code or the key, right? We did have an occasion where we cried together. But are you with me that sometimes the idea of compartmentalization is coached? Just pull it together. We've got to do this. I know you're in this space. Just pull it together. Secondly, it's modeled. It's just how I was raised. Just how I was raised. How many of you saw compartmentalization modeled in your families? <laughs> or, or in your extended family? We all know it's an issue, but no one talks about it. It just kind of is behind curtain number three. It's just how I was raised. Or it may just be something you have decided. I'll just smile and go on. I'll just smile and go on. How are you doing? Fine, fine, just fine, fine. Everything's fine, fine. Everything's fine, fine, fine. How are you? I think for some of us, if we pulled what was in these little dark cabinets out, we'd feel like we'd just fall apart all over everyone. And who wants to see ourselves become some kind of mess? Compartmentalizing, I believe, offers or has two offerings. The first is short-lived protection. It has a role and a place. It's a self-defense mechanism, isn't it? To protect ourselves. Um, we, we put an experience, we put a person, or we put something that's happened into its, its box, and it, as long as it stays in the box, we're, we're self-protected and guarded. But it's short-lived. And that short-lived nature of compartmentalizing is, is also revealed in the second thing that it offers, and it offers a self-deluded perspective. I got a text this morning from a dearly loved sister. Her name is Fran. When I was in ministry, I would tell other pastors, you need to find your Fran. Uh, Fran worked with me in a discipleship ministry. Uh, she uh, is, um, I'll just graciously say, she's a little older than I am, very wise. But Fran always had a knack to just ask me the question, that I didn't want her to ask. Are you sure you're doing okay? She just had a, a, a discernment that God had given her. Part of it was being um, a couple decades older than me and just having those kinds of eyes. When you're older and you look at someone who is immature or younger, you can just see them. Do you guys know what I mean? You can see them. And there were some things that she was able to see about me. I got a text from her today. She says, praying for you this morning, knowing the Holy Spirit is working. Preach well. Isn't that sweet? Just kind. This is the kind of sister in Christ that Fran Miller is. She always had that knack, and that's because we think we hide things in our cabinets, but the truth is, is they present themselves. They show out. They show out in our verbal communication, our nonverbal communication, our actions. What we think is so well hidden is really leaking out all over the place. This idea is exposed by the great theologian Bruce Hornsby. 
It's just the way it is. Some things will never change. That's just the way it is. Ah, but don't you believe them? I believe that we will have a uniquely better answer to be in a wholehearted devotion with Jesus as a result of going through our text today. That we can step away from this kind of common understanding that is just a part of life to kind of put, those, put things within walls or boxes or vaults and just move on. There is something uniquely better offered for us because of what Christ has wholly secured. And we're going to see two works that Christ has accomplished, finished. It is wholly and completely secure in Him and is made available to you and to me. And we need it. And there's a call then to respond to what He has wholly secured for us. And that, I hope, is what we will carry with us as we walk out of this space together today. In our text, uh, which Mitch read just a moment ago, Hebrews 10, verses 1 to 18, there's really going to be two sections, a smaller section and a larger section. The first one will show the first work that Christ wholly secured redemption. We've been talking about this a lot over the last several weeks. In fact, we have been under this theme that Jesus Christ is our great high priest since chapter 4 and chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 18 completes this discourse that Christ is our great high priest. And so we will look at the work that Christ has secured, and that is He has wholly secured our redemption. Then secondly, in the larger section of our passages, is really about our holiness or our sanctification that Christ has wholly secured. Christ wholly secured holiness. He's wholly secured holiness. I want to look at these different uh, sections, these two sections, and, I, and I'll call out a feature from this passage that is not found, uh, at least thus far in our study, of, of how um, the, the author has laid out just some very clear sentences which summarize each portion of the passage. Look with me at Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 1. It says, For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. As we move through this text, the unique feature of this passage is at the end of each subsection, so here we're looking at these first four verses, the last statement is its summary. Verse 4 is the summary of of that entire uh, set of verses. It's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. It's impossible for animals to be the full payment for human sin. This is what we have seen over and over through our passage. It was the focus of of the teaching from last week. Looking at Hebrews chapter 9, there was a redemption that was provided through Jesus Christ through His once and for all sacrifice, and that is what we are being reminded of here. The author is building on his argument, and Christ has wholly secured redemption for those who have believed. It's a reminder that a, that a human system cannot solve the problem of a human soul. We cannot be our own answer. We cannot do enough to overcome our sin. It took God taking on the form of a person, Jesus Christ, to die and to give his life for us as a perfect sacrifice. Jesus died. He was buried. He rose from the dead. And that sacrifice, the shedding of his blood and the application of his blood for those who believe is what 
redeems us. It's what saves us. And that's the gift that is made available to any and everyone who's here. Do you want forgiveness of your sin? Then it is to believe that Jesus died for you and rose from the dead. Man, that's my prayer for everyone here. We will pro- proclaim that truth as long as there's breath in our lungs because it is the central truth that everyone must know, everyone must understand, and my prayer is that everyone would believe. The Old Testament system could not secure redemption. It was a temporary satisfaction of God's wrath, but what Jesus ushered in was a holy, secured redemption. There is no other sacrifice to make. So that's his first work that moves and prompts us towards a whole devotion to him. But the passage continues with its primary theme of being made holy or being made perfect. And we need to understand what the writer is trying to say. So pick up with me. In verse 5, it says, Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. Verse 8, When he had said above, you have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then Christ added, behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. The first section, verse 1 to 4, said animal sacrifices cannot redeem us from sin. In this section, verses 5 through 10, verse 10 has the summary statement, and by that will, the will of Christ to offer himself, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. The book of Hebrews draws from Old Testament poetry quite often, doesn't it? As we have gone through the book, we've seen over and over the author make connections for us. Well, what he does here is he takes Psalm 40, verses 6 through 8, and we find that the words there are actually the personal words of Jesus himself. Psalm 40 declares that the animal sacrifices are not enough. But in that it says, but a body have you prepared for me. This is talking about Jesus and his incarnation. When Jesus became a man, he took on flesh. He was responding to the truth that it would take a perfect sacrifice of a person in order to be the sufficient payment for the sin of people. So we have the words of Jesus saying this. So he has not only wholly secured our Redemption, but what does it say in verse 10? It says that he sanctified us. Isn't that wonderful? This verse needs to have a bracket or an underline or a circle. There are different ways that others have outlined this passage, and some have used what's called a chiasm, which is where the beginning of the passage parallels the end of the passage. The next section parallels the the, section there, and it comes to a center point that is the primary point of a text. It works like this. Verse 10 is the focal point. If you don't have it yet circled and underlined, Uh, Let me encourage you to do that. Let me read it again. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. What I love about this is that this, this idea is, it's done. You see that the past tense By the will of Christ, we have been sanctified. 
So there's something that's declared true about those of us who are in Christ. Now, sanctified, that sounds like a really churchy word. Brothers and sisters, we have been sanctified. But what does it mean? Well, there's several ideas wrapped up in this that are precious gifts from Jesus for the believer. First, to be sanctified means to be thoroughly cleansed. Our sin has been taken away. We've been washed. In a previous message, I talked about different levels of clean. I think the highest is grandma clean. If grandma's coming, things better be clean. Well, Christ has washed us. He's cleansed us of our sin. If you have some kind of compartmentalized darkness back there that is, that is really a voice of shame, the power of the cross breaks through the baffles and is strong to wash you fully and completely and to take away the stain of sin. Part of sanctification is to be cleansed fully. Also to be sanctified means to be set apart for a purpose. That we have not only moved out of a place of of sin and under condemnation of God's wrath against our sin, not only have we been removed from the shame of our sin, we have been called into a life of being like Jesus, walking with Jesus, knowing God. We have been set apart to be different in this world. That is what sanctified means. It is that we have been cleansed and called into a new life. Look at verse 11. It says, And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. Do you see how this is in parallel with what we read earlier? That chapter 10 opened up with the fact that the animal sacrifices couldn't do it. Animal sacrifices could not take away sins. Now this theme is repeated about the priests. Even the priests offering sacrifices over and over and over. They're not capable of taking away sin. Verse 12. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. We talked about this truth in previous messages also, where the, high, where the priests would be on their feet doing the sacrificial work. They would have a variety of different offerings, offerings that we saw listed in chapter 10 already. Sin offerings and guilt offerings and fellowship offerings and different offerings were being made and they were always on their feet. But not Jesus. It says Christ offered for all time a holy, secured sacrifice was made. He sat down at the right hand of God. So that offering work that priests would do, Jesus did once and for all and then sat down. But it is not this resigned, sitting back. This is not what our Jesus is doing. After it says that in the text that he has sat down at the right hand, what's the word that Jesus is doing? What does it say? Waiting. You see that? It's not on the screen, I don't think. Oh yeah, it is. Verse 13. Waiting. You ever seen someone uh, sit with anticipation? What's he waiting to do? Waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. We talked about last week, eagerly waiting for Christ's return. Not only are the people of God eagerly waiting for Christ to return, 
Christ himself is eagerly waiting to come get us. And as he's waiting, he's waiting to bring to bring the full justice of God. He's waiting to bring a full completion for all time to glorify those who have been redeemed and sanctified and finally, ultimately, to be glorified. This is our Jesus. This is what he has accomplished for us and this is what he's doing. He's actively seeking after our hearts, y'all. Why should we ever resist him thinking that our form of self-protection is ultimately what's better for us than having the renewing, all-powerful love of Christ to come in? I love verse 14. Here's the summary of this section. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Two ideas from this passage. First of all, he has perfected. If you want to underline and circle this, a commentator used this language to to define what has perfected means. He says, decisively purged. I like that. For those who are in Christ... His sacrifice has decisively purged you of your sin. It's not temporary. It is wholly secured. Your holiness, your sanctification has been fully and completely secured in Christ. He has done it. But we also see the truth that's in this passage that not only do we stand in a place of holiness before God, but we are also in process of being made holy. And we've talked about this before through this book of this progressive sanctification of I am made holy, I am becoming holy, and I will be holy. And we live in the day in and the day out of this process of being made holy. And that's what this text says. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. This being sanctified comes down to your decision and my decision on a daily basis of where will we bring our allegiance? Where will we bring our devotion? The answer is to Christ and to Christ alone. And like in the previous section, a statement was made and then an Old Testament poem was brought in to undergird that. The same thing happens in this text, only instead of drawing out of Psalms, the writer draws out of Jeremiah chapter 31. Look at verse 15 with me. It says, And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us, for after saying... This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Verse 17, then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. If we go back to verses 15 and 16, again, this is a quotation out of Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. This was given special emphasis in the book of Hebrews in chapter 8. We learned about the new covenant and the key person of the Trinity that ushered in the new covenant or sealed the new covenant was the Holy Spirit. So you have the testimony of Christ, I am the perfect sacrifice, I have sanctified for all time those who believe in me through my sacrifice, and now the Holy Spirit confirms and bears witness there is a new relationship with God that has been made through Christ. It has been affirmed by the Son. It has been affirmed by the Spirit. Christ wholly secured our holiness. I hope it washes over you, perhaps in a fresh way, 
that your sin is not held against you if you're in Christ. I think it's what prompted Breakaway Ministries to write the song, Draw Near, that we sang. I don't know if you knew this or not, but that song is the first recorded piece of music from Breakaway Ministries at Texas A&M. And we sang it with our, with our hearts. Y'all sounded beautiful. I listened. But are we drawing near in a wholehearted devotion to the Lord? Or are there pieces and parts of ourselves that we are just keeping closed off? I believe holiness calls us into wholeness. Holiness calls us into wholeness. The call from this passage and into our lives, the call not just from this passage, but in response to the truth that Jesus Christ is our great high priest, is that we would respond in a wholehearted devotion to Him. Holy, devote your life to Christ. That is the call. So if that's the call, what's behind the wall? I've lived enough life to know that um, it's really tempting to compartmentalize our hurt, our pain, our shame. And we can live a long time putting on the fine smile. Yet really resisting the kind of healing and renewal that I think God longs to bring us. I was talking with a family uh, this morning. They were talking about community and their longing for community because they had a season in their life where it was real. They didn't use this word, but to me it was them saying that they had wholehearted relationships with, with people that were safe, that in some ways were closer than family. There's a desire in us to be made whole. And I think there are some of you in this room that you're living with your guard up. You know the, how the algorithms work on our social media, especially with these things that have come to us called reels, that once you watch something, it keeps showing up. Well, lately I like lingered and watched a Mike Tyson fight. And so that's what I keep seeing in my reels, that and uh, like a, a shuffle dance that I can't do. It doesn't make any sense, but it keeps showing up, I guess, because I keep seeing it. But Mike Tyson was this figure that just had a near impenetrable guard. And I think that there are some who are here today that this is, this is your life right now. You can sing the words to draw near, but you have put a guard up. And I think it can seem overwhelming to to let Christ in, to let others in. But that guardedness keeps you from a wholehearted devotion to the Lord. It gets in the way. Because so much energy and distraction is spent on just trying to self-protect. 
Do I want you to have a quiet time, church? I absolutely want you to have a quiet time. But now I'm not talking about quiet times. I'm talking about a wholehearted pursuit where you give access to the work of God in your life. And if that means getting help, then get help. If that means talking things out, then talk things out. But you keeping things locked behind vaults is not producing the joy and the peace that has been made possible for you. It's why he died for you. It's why he sacrificed himself. Not that you would be sacrificing yourself over and over and over just to somehow self-medicate or self-protect. It's not your job. It's what he came to do to restore you, to heal you, to love you. And there's freedom when holiness calls you into wholeness. There's an invitation that stands every week. Every day. If you are ready to have God's sanctifying, cleansing light shine in the darkness, you don't have to do it alone. It's why we're here. And we'll draw near together.